Order. It is time for questions to the Minister for Justice. We will start with 15 minutes of topical questions. And I call Mr. Ian Miller. Thank you very much, sir, Deputy Speaker. I would like to ask the Minister what input um, will the Department for Justice, Justice have in terms of reference and in investigation into child um, exploitation? Well, I thank Mr. Mellon for the question, although indeed I better not say too much. I might annoy one of his colleagues if I go too far into the territory, which is question one on the main list. Uh, but uh, the answer is that there were no specific uh, uh, actions required for the DOJ within the Bernardo's report of 2011. But since then, we have been working in, in partnership with DHS SPS and the Safeguarding Board, looking at our varied um, roles in the protection of children. And I have had meetings with the Minister of Health and with others to look at how that occurs. And as members will know, an expert-led inquiry is being set up to see what the way forward is. Call Mr. Milne for supplementary. Um, I would like to thank the Minister there for his answer thus far. But could the, could the Minister tell us you know, that, uh, exactly you know, what those discussions consist of you know, with the Minister for Health? And uh, would he not agree that at the heart of this all is an issue of justice, and therefore it is. Uh, uh, in my opinion, very necessary for the Justice Department there to be uh, heavily involved in it. Well, sorry, Deputy Speaker, I really am at a loss. My understanding was that uh, questions at this stage were not supposed to preempt questions which are on the list. Um, any, 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 any further answer would merely preempt an answer which is to a prepared question and is not particularly topical. I'd remind the Minister it's entirely up to yourself whether to answer or not. I will happily answer in 15 minutes' time. I call Mr. Mitchell McLaughlin. Thank you very much, Deputy Speaker. And could I ask the Minister just to comment on his uh, ongoing relationships with the POA? Um, I have not had any direct contact with the POA in recent weeks. I have certainly had engagement with the POA over different aspects of the reform programme. Uh, senior officers of the prison service continue in those discussions, and I am keen to see that we manage the, the reform process in conjunction with all our staff, whether they are members of POA, PGA, NIPSA, or none of them. Call Mr. McLaughlin for his supplementary. Thank you very much, Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answer. Uh, can the Minister give an assurance to the House that uh, his change agenda and reform agenda will not be deflected despite uh, difficulties or resistance from within the, the institutions? Well, I can certainly give Mr McLaughlin that assurance. As I said, answering questions a few minutes ago, uh, we have seen uh, a short-term withdrawal of goodwill by the POA recently, uh, which has ended in, you know, in the last few weeks, and which I hope is a sign that good progress will continue to be made but I am absolutely committed to ensuring that the reform programme is driven through uh, against all the operational difficulties. And I'm not just saying that that applies to staff. I'm saying the practical realities of the end-to-end -end reform are quite a challenge. Call Mr Trevor Clark. Uh, thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Minister, will his department support the POA in relation to making a presentation to the pay review body? Well, my understanding is quite simple, Deputy Speaker, that the, uh, the pay review body will seek the evidence that they wish. They've had a detailed uh, evidence presentation from my department, and they will clearly have to engage with staff, including the POA, as they review the work that they have to do, looking at the matter which I referred to them. Call Mr Clark for supplementary. Using the Minister's words in terms of the evidence, given that the evidence is clear in terms of the threat to all prison officers, um, will the Minister then support an environmental allowance to be paid to all officers who are currently working for the prison service? Well, Deputy Speaker, I appreciate Mr Clark's point, but the reality is that for many existing staff, the previous environmental allowance was consolidated into normal pay scales. The issue which is a particular concern is of new members of staff who may feel that they are being paid less proportionately by comparison uh, with their colleagues who ha have received that consolidated award and in comparison to what happens in England, Wales and in Scotland. Because it is not appropriate to make a direct comparison, as is frequently done, although not by Mr Clark today, with the issues it applies to police officers. 
where police officers across the UK are paid on the same scale and there is an additional allowance in Northern Ireland. In Northern Ireland, we have completely different pay scales and the issue is ensuring that they bear an appropriate relationship to the pay scales for England or Wales or for Scotland. Mr Alex Maskey is not in his place. I move on to Mr Jerry Kelly. Uh, Did the Minister agree with me at the, the uh, recent uh, opening up of the um, recruitment process for the PSNI is to be welcomed and also that it uh, allows for a further transformation and civilianisation of the police service, which, as the Minister will know, is not yet fully representative of the society we live in? Well, as the Member will know from his role on the policing board, uh, there are issues around the numbers and there are issues around the budget. I welcome the fact that the police service is now in the position to start a new recruitment campaign for the first time in some years. I think the important issue for this recruitment campaign, given that the specific artificial 50-50 targets are removed, is to get the best possible affirmative action programme, which is being carried through by the police service, to ensure they get the widest possible range of applicants and continue the work that they've been doing in recent years to ensure that they become a representative service. Call Mr. Kelly for supplementary. Uh, thank you, Minister, for the, the answer so far. I mean, the, the, the department, his department, is uh, responsible for uh, the business case for uh, recruitment. Would the minister agree that it's uh, lamentable that the criminal justice inspector described uh, what we have uh, as large-scale reverse civilianisation, um, not as patents in the PSNI, where civilian posts are being repopulated? Uh, are being uh, populated by retired police, and would he agree that this recruitment campaign provides an excellent opportunity to put that right? Bearing in mind that the recruitment is not just the 100 that we're talking about now, but is now going to go through uh, perhaps up to 400. Well, I think the difficult issue of exactly which uh, functions are best carried out by warranted officers and which by civilians and what the background of those civilians may be is not one which is for my direct involvement. I need to be very careful to leave the policing board with its responsibilities in such matters. I remind members of the House to discourage this reading questions and move on to Dr Alistair Macdonald. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. Could I, could I uh, ask the Minister that in the light of the continued flag protests in Belfast, particularly around the city centre, would the Minister of Justice agree with me that such protests might it would be in the interest of all concerned if such protests were suspended during the Haas process. Well, Deputy Speaker, I, I appreciate the question. I'm not quite sure how far I have a ministerial responsibility for it, but certainly in terms of the responsibility to ensure a more normal society, better opportunities for business, especially in Belfast City Centre, and the chance to benefit from the five-party talks which Dr Haas is leading, then I certainly believe it would be beneficial if any protests, whether they are around Donegal Square or Twiddell Avenue, were suspended immediately to allow this society to move on and to find a different way of dealing with the community problems of the past. Call Dr Macdonald for a supplementary. Well, I, I very much thank the Minister, particularly if it is slightly off-centre off in terms of his responsibility, but nevertheless we uh, see him as having a major role there. But would he agree with me that, that uh, such protests are a big threat, as they were last year, to trade in Belfast City Centre in the run-up to Christmas, and we all of us have a collective responsibility to do all that we can to, to reduce that threat to the retail trade? Well, yes, Deputy Speaker, I certainly agree with Dr Macdonald on that point. I had a recent meeting with business representatives from the City Centre, and it is absolutely clear that there has been a major difficulty with business in Belfast City Centre in recent months way beyond the effects of the economic recession generally as is applied in other parts of Northern Ireland. I believe that if there are further problems in the run-up to Christmas this year, it will be devastating for many businesses in Belfast City Centre and also, I suppose, particularly many services. Uh, it's possible that somebody may go back to a shop the next week if they're deterred from going to one week. They don't go back to the restaurant or the pub the next week. And it's clear that that has been very damaging. That is why I believe we collectively have a responsibility to urge people to call off such protests and to ensure that we conduct our processes in this place or through the House talks. Call Ms Bronwyn McGahan for questions. Uh, would the Minister of Justice comment on the recent public disclosure that the British Ministry of Defence is unlawfully holding more than 66,000 files in a privately owned warehouse in Sw Swaddling Coach, South Derbyshire, many of which came from the British Army headquarters in the north of Ireland, which was closed four years ago? 
I think, Deputy Speaker, that what is being done by a UK department in England is far beyond the responsibility of the DOJ in Northern Ireland. The member has the right to ask a supplementary. Gurami Ogut, would the Minister agree that the fact that this was never disclosed to the PSNI's historical inquiry team and was never discovered by that team is cause for further concern about the lack of rigour and effectiveness by the HGT when it came to reviewing British Army killings? And would he agree to write to the, the, the British Ministry of Defence to ensure that those files are secured and not destroyed? Well, I think, Deputy Speaker, the key issue around that is around the operational work done by the historical inquiries team and whether there were specific requests for information which were not forthcoming, uh, what relationship may be between the HET or the PSNI and the Ministry of Defence, I am not cited on, and therefore I am not sure I am in any position to give a specific comment there. Mr Michael McJimpsey is not in his place. I call Mr Joe Byrne. I call Mr. Joe Byrne. Mr. Deputy Speaker, can I ask the Minister, is he content with the procedures that are being currently put in place for the new recruitment process for new PSNI officers? Well, done, Joe. well, again, whilst I can appreciate Mr. Byrne wishes to ask the question, that is a matter for the PSNI and for the Policing Board and not for the Department of Justice, uh, but I have no reason to believe that the procedures are not proper. Call Mr. Byrne for supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I appreciate the Minister has a limited role and function in this regard, but given that he is the Minister for Justice, is it appropriate that he would be blindsided if there were any misdemeanours in relation to the recruitment process? Well, again, uh, Deputy Speaker, the key role there rests with the Policing Board, not with the Department of Justice. But if there are specific concerns that Mr Byrne or any other member wishes to raise, I would happily have them raised. But I need to be careful that I don't interfere in the responsibility of other members of this House or on the board. Call Mr Robin Newton. Uh, thank you, Mr uh, Deputy Speaker. I wonder would the Minister agree with me that it is absolutely necessary that the PSNI, in the cases of child abuse, actually interview and carry out an extensive interview until they believe that they have got to the full truth, regardless of the position that anyone might hold in society? Well, yes, Deputy Speaker, I believe that the police have a duty to carry out their investigations as thoroughly as they need to in accordance with the legal advice that they are given on particular cases. Would the Minister agree with me that there is a, a significant amount of concern around the uh, case uh, which involved the leader of uh, Sinn Féin and a perception within the wider community that indeed uh, the interviews may not have been as rigorous as one might have expected? Well, Deputy Speaker, I'm not sure I'm a barometer from what perceptions in wider society may be which appears to be the request of Mr Newton. Um, all, I, all I know is that I have no reason to believe that the police and the PPS did not carry out their duties properly in the case to which Mr Newton refers, as I understand they do as a general rule in other cases. That concludes topical questions to the Minister for Justice. We'll move on now to the oral questions, and I call Ms Megan Pearan. Uh, cast over here in question one, please. Deputy Speaker, on the 10th of September, Edwin Poots and I jointly chaired a summit on the issue of child sexual exploitation at which key agencies were represented. That summit identified that much is already being done within and across government departments and the statutory and voluntary agencies to tackle issues of sexual violence and abuse, including human trafficking and sexual exploitation. Following the summit, Mr Poots and I attended a special joint meeting with the Health and Justice Committees on the 16th of September. Following further engagement between us, on the 25th of September, it was announced that we had agreed to establish an expert-led independent inquiry into the issue of child sexual exploitation. The inquiry will be supported jointly by the Regulation and Quality Improvement Authority and Criminal Justice Inspection Northern Ireland, and will seek to assist in developing an effective regional response to sexual exploitation in Northern Ireland. 
Terms of reference will be agreed following the appointment of the independent chair. I have also engaged with the Minister of Health, Social Services and Public Safety in relation to the review which the Safeguarding Board for Northern Ireland is to carry out. Does he agree that it is important for his department to have an input into the terms of reference? Well, yes, Deputy Speaker, I agree it is important that we should have an input into the terms of reference, and indeed that is taking place. Uh, what we need to do is to establish, first of all, the independent chair, and then work with the chair on detailing the terms of reference in conjunction with the two departments. I call Mr. Fergal McKinney. Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the Minister? And can he tell the House, in terms of children in care, uh, what is the definition for recording purposes of missing? I'm afraid, Deputy Speaker, I can't uh, answer that question for Mr. McKinney. I think it's something that might have to be referred to my ministerial colleague, Mr. Poots. Mr. Paul Given. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Will, will the Minister give a very clear public statement that, in respect of children that are abused, whether they be in care uh, or, or children that are in institutions, uh, regardless of where that abuse has taken place, if anybody knows about it, that they report that to the police immediately, and there should be never any withholding of information of the, the type of abuse that we have witnessed? Well, Deputy Speaker, I am happy to endorse the point that Mr. Given makes. I um, will widen it. Anybody who has any knowledge of any criminal activity has a duty to inform the police and to ensure that they assist in any way they can in bringing the perpetrators to justice. And that is nowhere more obvious than in some of these dreadful crimes which affect the welfare of children or indeed of vulnerable adults. Call Mr. Roy Beggs. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Young people in care do experience a higher level of grooming, but the problem also exists to vulnerable young people in our community. Can the Minister advise us? Has the Department of Education, has the Minister of Education engaged with himself and the Minister for Health to ensure that the resilience of all our young people is reassessed in order that those would try, that would try to exploit them would be prevented from uh, accessing them and abusing them? Well, I certainly agree with Mr Begg's point about uh, the importance of ensuring that all young people are protected, not just those within the care system. Uh, I think the key issue for that relates to the, the work being done by the Safeguarding Board, which of course comes under DHSSPS. I have not had direct engagement with the Minister of Education on this issue. The engagement has been at this stage led by the DOJ and DHSSPS. Well, Mr Tom Elliott for a question. Uh, question number two, Deputy Speaker. <clears throat> Deputy Speaker, in order to extend the remit of the National Crime Agency into the devolved arena and to build in appropriate local safeguards about its operation here, the consent of the Assembly is required before secondary legislation can be made at Westminster. In practical terms, that would require me to consult the Justice Committee on a statutory operating model for the NCA and to secure the agreement of the Executive. The Crime and Courts Act 2013 provides the Home Secretary with order-making powers so that the NCA provisions can be fully extended to Northern Ireland with the appropriate consent arrangements with the Assembly. I call Mr Elliott for a supplementary. Uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for that answer. But would the Minister confirm to us here today that he will not permit so many concessions within uh, the NCA legislative framework uh, that would allow it basically to have such diminished significance in Northern Ireland that it would not be of great importance to, to the national security? Well, Deputy Speaker, I appreciate the point Mr Elliott is seeking to make. Indeed, he's made it in the chamber before now. Uh, I am concerned to see that we get the NCA operating in the way which enables its full powers to be used against criminality and organised crime of a variety of sources within Northern Ireland, subject to the appropriate safeguards of our operating model here. I believe that we have made significant progress around that, and that has not involved diluting the powers of the NCA, but has involved uh, working around the accountability mechanisms. What is absolutely clear is we do not yet have the political agreement which will enable us to make that progress, but I have not lost sight that we should be able to make that progress, and I and my officials are continuing to engage with those in this House who are at this stage unable to agree the proposals as they currently stand. But I do, certainly do not see there will be any prospect of the kind of diminution which is spoken of by Mr Elliott. 
Call Mr Gregory Campbell. Thank you, Mr uh, Deputy Speaker. The, the Minister has been clear enough in spelling out uh, the, the problems that uh, arise at the moment because we don't have the framework. Could he be equally clear in terms of what the people of Northern Ireland are missing in terms of the NCA operating here and potentially the impact that it would have on the people of Northern Ireland if we don't have the full implementation of the National Crime Agency here? Well, Deputy Speaker, again, Mr Campbell makes a good point, but he's almost asking me to define a negative. Um, what we simply will not have uh, if we don't have full operational powers is that NCA will not be able to deliver the, the same uh, assistance to the PSNI in the fight against organised crime that until the 7th of October we had from the Serious Organised Crime Agency. It will hamper uh, a variety of crimes, including issues like child exploitation and human trafficking, drug smuggling, uh, fuel laundering. It will not necessarily mean that, the, that those activities cannot be carried out against such, such criminals, but it will mean that the PSNI has to devote resources which would otherwise be available from the NCA. I suspect there is a danger of a confusion of role if uh, members of uh, various agencies are not sure exactly what the role of the NCA is in our current difficulties, and there will be a specific issue about only being able to use reserve powers for civil recovery uh, and it will not be able to use its powers of civil recovery in the, you know, in the devolved field. So issues like armed robbers and fuel launderers may well find that their assets cannot be seized as they currently stand. There will also be a problem that any claim which is made for civil recovery uh, by the NCA for an issue here can only be made in the Northern Ireland High Court and cannot be replicated in London and Edinburgh on the current restrictions. So there are a number of different restrictions and at this stage we have both the PSNI working to fill in the gap as best they can and the engagement which is going on by my department with other members to see if we can get the arrangements fixed. Call Mr Raymond McCartney. Uh, would the Minister agree with me that there is actually now an opportunity for him as the Minister of Justice to bring forward legislation which would tackle serious crime and indeed make it very, very effective, but importantly make it accountable? Well, Deputy Speaker, I'm not sure what legislation I could bring through on any meaningful timescale which would enable us to fix the current gap. Because even if we were to seek uh, to bring forward a new bill in this place, and even if there were complete political agreement, there would be a significant gap to allow the consultation, the drafting, the processes in this House. And I do not believe we can wait for those processes to be gone through. I believe that we have now got to the situation that the accountability mechanisms are in place to allow the NCA to operate within Northern Ireland, subject to our normal policing architecture here, subject to the primacy of the PSNI, the specific lead role for the Chief Constable in approving actions by the NCA, subject to accountability to the Ombudsman reporting to the Policing Board. All of those are issues which I believe we have already got, and I don't see any way in which there would be any benefit from legislating in this place. Call Mrs. Dolores Kelly. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Um, and as the Minister uh, will be aware, we all want to see an effective and accountable NCA operating as soon as possible. Uh, given his, his last comments, Minister, could you give us some indication of your uh, pro progress on those points with the Home Secretary? Well, the issue has not been so much as Mrs Kelly talks about progress with the Home Secretary at this stage. The progress with the Home Secretary was made uh, several months ago and has been refined on a couple of occasions since. The issue now has to be to obtain progress with the two parties in this place which are not yet happy with the arrangements. Call Mr Sidney Anderson for the question. Uh, question number three, Mr Deputy Speaker. Deputy Speaker, at the outset, I should say that terrorism is primarily a matter for the Secretary of State and the Chief Constable. I can advise, however, that the threat level in Northern Ireland remains at severe, which means an attack is highly likely. There have been 14 attacks to the 14th of October this year. Police officers, soldiers and prison officers remain the primary targets. It is clear, however, that the terrorists are not concerned about the safety of anyone. Unfortunately, we have also seen paramilitary groups executing their own perverse view of justice with the callous and brutal murder of Kevin Kearney in North Belfast on the 8th of October. There is no place for this in our society, and I utterly condemn all such violent activity, including the appalling murder of Barry McCrory. 
I understand that the two men arrested last week in, rela in relation to attack on a woman in East Belfast on the 25th of September have now been released on peace, uh, police bail pending further inquiries. Murderous attacks, assaults, shootings, victimisation and intimidation by any paramilitary organisation cannot be justified. Neither unionist nor nationalist uh, terrorists can be allowed to thwart the progress that Northern Ireland has made in moving forward. There is no doubt that there would be more attacks were it not for the success of the security forces in disrupting and preventing them. Having met both the Tornister and the Minister of Justice and Equality in the last week, I can also attest to the high level of cross-border cooperation. Whilst the efforts of security forces on both sides of the border have contained the level of activity and undoubtedly saved lives, it has not diminished the intent of these groups. Everyone in Northern Ireland must remain vigilant and report any information they have either to the police or anonymously to the Crime Stoppers charity. Call Mr. Anderson for supplementary. Thank you, Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for that answer. But can I ask the Minister, uh, in light of what he's just said, uh, what further discussions will he have with the uh, police and the NIO in light uh, of what has taken place and to deal with further disruption and terrorist activity on the lead up to Christmas, Minister? Well, Deputy Speaker, I can tell Mr. Anderson I have regular meetings with the Secretary of State and the Chief Constable looking at the issues of the interface between her responsibilities and mine in the justice field. But the key issue must remain the support of the entire community for the work being done by the PSNI, extending to the provision of intelligence where people have any information which can assist the police, and a robust standing together against those who would threaten us from whatever side. Call Mr. Robin Swan for supplementary. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answer so far. Minister, in regard to the recent murders that have happened, can the Minister inform the House if any of the guns or the ammunition used in the murders in the past four years have a prehistory before 1998? Uh, the answer, Deputy Speaker, is no. I cannot inform the House what the position of that is. Um, that would be a matter which I suspect will be one for forensic science uh, to carry out investigations and to report to the courts at an appropriate time. Call Mr. Alden McGuinness. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for uh, his replies. Uh, would the Minister agree with me, given the, uh, the obvious danger from uh, terrorists, um, particularly distant uh, Republicans, uh, would you agree that, in fact, uh, those who engage in demonstrations and public protests divert uh, resources from the fight against terrorism? Well, it, it is clearly the case, as Mr McGuinness hints, that when police officers are required in large numbers to deal with public disorder and a variety of demonstrations, that that is diverting officers from carrying out other duties. Uh, but I wouldn't stop where he stopped in terms of his concern about the activities of dissident Republicans. It is clear that there are also dissident unionists who are carrying out similar attacks seeking to impose their will on local communities across Northern Ireland, and we need to ensure the police officers are deployed against both. I should have pointed out that question seven and eight have been withdrawn. I now call Ms Anna Lowe. Ms Lowe. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Question number four, please. Deputy Speaker, human trafficking is a heinous crime that has a devastating toll on its victims. I am committed to making sure that we have a robust and effective system in place in Northern Ireland to prevent people from being trafficked and exploited, to protect those who are victims and to pursue those who perpetrate this crime through the courts. I accept that this involves reviewing law and procedure and promoting changes as necessary. For instance, members will be aware of the new offences I introduced under the Criminal Justice Act of 2013 and of the progress that my department is making against the Human Trafficking Action Plan. So I agree with the member that the approach requires flexibility. Call Ms Lowe for supplementary. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, keeping in mind the importance of flexibility, does the Minister um, share my concerns that some aspects of Lord Morrow's private member's bill may serve, to, may serve to reduce flexibility and therefore could be counterproductive in our attempts to uh, address human trafficking. Well, yes, Deputy Speaker, it's, it's no great secret that Lord Morrow and I have discussed different aspects of the bill 
um, including those aspects which reduce flexibility around prosecution decisions, um, around the, uh, the automatic granting of, of immunity to victims, um, and indeed around a mandatory minimum sentence. So I, I do have concerns about aspects of that bill, but those are issues which I have discussed with Lord Morrow. I suspect I will continue to discuss with Lord Morrow, and which the Justice Committee in particular and the House in general will have an opportunity to make its mind up on. Call Lord Morrow. Uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker. Uh, it's interesting to note that I think this question is more to do with Lord Morrow's bill than it has to do with what the Minister is doing or not doing. Uh, could I ask the Minister, bearing in mind that he has all the flexibility that he claims that he needs at present, we have had two convictions to date. De facto, it's legal now. So does the Minister not accept that what he has got is simply not working and it's time for something better? Yeah. Well, Deputy Speaker, the fact we can say we've only had two convictions is clearly a matter of some concern. But we should also acknowledge that the numbers of cases which we believe we're talking about is a very limited number. And uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure that if we merely looked at the issue of um, conviction rates in terms of some other offences, whether we would necessarily say that they were being successful, but they are there as a clear marker. And I think the fact we have now had a guideline judgment uh, in terms of the case of Matches Peace is an indication of ser how seriously the courts are taking cases. But as ever, I repeat the point that one of the key issues is that the police need information from members of the public to report the concerns they have. If there are uh, issues which don't seem to be quite right in terms of the number of people coming and going to houses, if there are issues about uh, people who are in a workplace who do not seem able to, uh, to live their own life independently, those kind of points are matters which should be brought to the attention of the police. And that is the key issue to ensure that the community unites. I saw some very positive work last week and a visit to Armagh College, Dremore High School and Region House Grammar School. I have no doubt that there are many young people across this society are learning the lessons and becoming aware, but we need to ensure that some older people also become aware and report their concerns as well. Call Ms Rosalie McCrory. Why, I got a, a, a last call you this going to be a session. I as a regular good Shaw, thank you, Mr uh, Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answers thus far. Could I ask the Minister, in relation to human traffic, trafficking, since he came into office, uh, how uh, many different types of human trafficking, for what reasons have people been trafficked, can he outline over that period? Well, I can uh, give the House the basic statistics as they stand at the moment. Since the establishment of the NRM in April 2009 until the start of October 2013, there are a total of 104 referrals from Northern Ireland, of which uh, 65 had positive decisions at the initial stage, the reasonable ground stage, for acceptance into the national referral mechanism, and at the conclusive grounds stage, 37 positive decisions were made. Uh, there are a number of cases still, still pending at both levels, but what it means is so far there have been only 37 people accepted into the NRM in that period of something more than four years which slightly predates my appointment as Minister. But it is absolutely clear that there is significant work being done. Last week I had a meeting um, on a north-south basis with the Minister of Justice and Equality and a number of relevant agencies at a seminar dealing with trafficking there. I also attended uh, the regular meeting of the Interdepartmental Ministerial Group led by the Home Office, but on this occasion chaired by the Prime Minister. And as well as the, uh, the meetings I just said, I, I engaged in with three as college and two schools. So there is clearly a significant effort being uh, directed across all the jurisdictions of these islands against trafficking, but fundamentally those who would uh, carry out that work as statutory bodies require the support of the community to do it. Well, Mr Cahill Boylan for a question. Cash to recur, Glenna Hall, question number five, please. Deputy Speaker, the reforms currently published for public consultation in relation to legal aid would see the rates of remuneration for Crown Court work being reduced overall by 45% for solicitors and 30% for counsel. This would bring the fees paid in Northern Ireland into line with the fees paid in England and Wales. The reforms would also remove the higher guilty plea to fees, which could act as a disincentive to the entry of an early guilty plea and introduce new fees to cover omissions in the rules. 
on the basis that this is an adjustment to the fees paid to lawyers working in Crown Court cases and does not affect anyone's eligibility for legal aid, I am content that no applicant for legal aid will be disadvantaged. The reforms being undertaken to civil legal aid ensure that those who are eligible will continue to be provided with appropriate representation paid for by the public purse. I have published proposals to introduce fixed fees for legal aid and civil cases, which will save £14 million annually, including £3 million in administration costs and improve accountability. I have also proposed changes to legal aid funding for representation in civil cases, which will ensure that only the level of representation actually required is funded by legal aid. I am confident that those assisted by legal aid will continue to be able to obtain the level of representation that they need. I have also published proposals to harmonise the financial eligibility tests for advice by way of representation and civil legal aid. Those proposals would deliver an estimated 8.2% reduction in eligibility for civil legal aid, from 43.2% to 35% of the population. Although this will reduce the proportion of people in Northern Ireland that is eligible for legal aid, members should note that in England and Wales only 28% of the population is eligible. Call Mr. Boylan for supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and could I thank the Minister also for his answer. But could I ask the Minister to guarantee that access to justice will not be compromised by any reform of legal aid? Well, I can certainly assure Mr. Boylan, as I have assured the House before and the Committee as well, that it is my ambition to not take issues out of scope for legal aid unless an alternative better method can be provided. But there is no doubt that the financial challenges we face are placing significant pressure to the point that current expenditure on legal aid is meaning I am having to make cuts in other aspects of departmental expenditure in this year. And that is an issue which needs to be addressed. The key issue is to ensure that we maintain as far as possible access to uh, the legal advice that individuals need without necessarily funding adversarial appearances in court. Mr. Kieran McCarthy. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I understand that the Minister has uh, announced to the Law Society um, just this past weekend uh, that he intends to have a further review uh, into access to justice. Um, could the Minister give the Assembly uh, some further information on exactly what that would entail? Um, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that the member refers to an announcement to the Law Society. I'm not sure that all the members of the Law Society were entirely pleased with what they heard from me on Saturday morning, but that remains to be seen. Um, the key issue is following on from the Access to Justice Review, which was carried out by Jim Daniel, which was introduced shortly after devolution. There are some issues which need to be further considered to underpin those reforms and to ensure that we continue to make the reforms to provide the best possible arrangements for legal aid and legal services across Northern Ireland. Not something which is going to slow down the reform programme, because the reform programme cannot be uh, slowed down. But we need to look at issues like whether it's possible to make better use of um, advice agencies, better use of alternative dispute resolution rather than, as I've just said, you know, funding adversarial court appearances and ensuring that we find better ways of resolving problems without always resorting to litigation in the first place. So those are the kind of issues which I'm hoping we'll get some further work done on, and I'll be making a, a formal statement to the Assembly at an appropriate stage. Call Mr Peter Weir. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I thank the Minister for the responses he's given so far. Uh, can I ask the Minister, while there may not be a great deal of sympathy in the public on those who are at the higher end of the earning scales uh, in the legal profession, uh, what consideration is the Minister given in terms of this change of legal aid to the impact it will have on uh, small sisters' firms? Well, I appreciate the point that Mr Weir makes, but I'm not sure that it is my job as Minister of Justice to ensure the maintenance of a specific model of the provision of legal services. I noted, for example, in uh, the President's speech to the Law Society dinner, he referred to a solicitor and named a specific small village in County Tyrone. I suspect that most people in that village travel to the district town in order to get their groceries, and I'm not sure that they can necessarily expect that there will be a one-man solicitor's practice in all cases in every village that they might wish it. What I want to do is to see that people get access to advice, and it is not, I'm afraid, my responsibility uh, to ensure that the current model continues to be there. What I do wish to do is to see that the current model of solicitors firms across Northern Ireland continues in operation so that people do have those opportunities, but it simply cannot be assumed that it will be maintained without change as other services are changed. Call Mr Patsy McGlone. 
Colonel Mugget, last question for you. Could I just ask, in relation to the proposed cuts uh, to the legal aid budget, um, has the minister been made aware of the concerns that there are among many solicitors? In fact, that that will reduce or minimise the access to proper legal services among many people right across the north on the lower end of the income bracket and, in fact, have a, a, a negative effect on society as a whole? Well, I, d- I do have to say to Mr McLeod and others, I'm not actually in the process of reducing the budget for legal aid. I'm in the process of reducing expenditure to get it down to the level of the budget. And that is the fundamental challenge, that expenditure on legal aid has been running at something in the region of £100 million every year since just before devolution took place against a budget of 75, and that position cannot continue. But in terms of the issue of access, I'll just repeat the points that I, that I made in the original answer that we will still see 35% of the population of Northern Ireland eligible for legal aid, as opposed to 28% in England and Wales, the nearest comparable jurisdiction. I believe that is a significant statement of our desire to protect our people. I call Mr Fran McCann for a question. Mila Malgut, last con Kulia. Kesevra Shea, question five. I'll happily answer question six for Mr McCann. <laughs> Whilst naturally I have had general discussions with the police, I have not discussed specific policing decisions. That is because the policing of individual parades, protests and related disorder is an operational matter for the Chief Constable. As such, his accountability rests with the policing board. So I have had no discussions with him regarding the ongoing breaches of the Parades Commission's determinations in respect to the protest at Twiddell Avenue. I want to take this opportunity to highlight my concern at the recent call to increase protests, including the threat of civil disobedience. I would encourage all those with influence to consider an alternative way forward to bring about a peaceful conclusion to this issue. It is vital that they show leadership and work with their communities and the police to ease tensions where they exist. I'll Mr McCann for supplementary. And uh, thank the Minister for his correction there. It was daydreaming. But would the Minister join me in calling on everyone, including certain members of this Assembly, to desist from uh, further political confrontation with the PSNI on the streets of Belfast and to uphold the rule of law in keeping with the determination of the Prince Commission? Well, Deputy Speaker, I will happily repeat the comments I made in, your, in answer to the topical question uh, from Dr Macdonald. Yes, I believe we all have a responsibility to encourage people to obey the law, to desist from confrontational activity, to ensure that we do not continue with the current £60,000 a night expenditure on policing to Woodhill Avenue, Ardoin, uh, which is unnecessary, which has significant opportunity costs compared to the, the use of those officers to do normal policing duties. And I do hope that we will see a reduction in tension, as I said earlier, both around the city centre and around Woodvale and Ardoin. Call Ms Joanne Dobson. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Can the Minister give an assessment of the impact on community relations of the unveiling of a plaque to Shankill bomber Thomas Begley yesterday? Uh, I really do think, whilst I do my best to answer questions, Deputy Speaker, that an assessment for, uh, for community relations is a matter which lies with the Office of First Minister and Deputy First Minister and not mine. But what is clear is that even in the context of what happened yesterday, there was public disorder which had a cost for policing. That concludes questions to the Minister for...